update on kind of where we stand, um, thoughts on kind of, you know, a number of places that um, we looked at, kind of a, just a, a, a smattering or, or cross-section of places that we looked at to give everybody a concept of kind of the diligence that was done, um, you know, the good, bad, and, and ugly of why some places, you know, might look great on paper, but at the end of the day, you know, now we have really good course partners with with Kemper. We know, you know, so many of the top architects in the space that actually have visited sites on our behalf in many cases. Um, and then ultimately why, um, you know, making the right decisions on courses is so critical for the overall kind of success and longevity of the project. Uh, so that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, and maybe just a, a quick update for everybody, because this is not going to be the focus of the conversation at all, but there's some really exciting things happening with Spay as well. So we have uh, Bert McKay, who is our new GM at Spay. The guy is an absolute legend. We've heard nothing but great things about him um, in the golf space. He came from Castle Rock in Northern Ireland, a Scotsman, and wanted to move back to Scotland and was very excited about what we're doing and what we're building. So he's now running the show over at Spay for us. We also have our new architect, I'm sorry, our new um, uh, greenskeeper, head greenskeeper joining uh, this coming month and then building out the team there. So we're thrilled uh, to kind of welcome uh, a new and extremely highly talented greenskeeping team into the space. And we are, um, we are now kind of finalizing a couple different details on the course. We're gonna be drilling a new borehole for water. Um, because as we're building new greens, uh, you know, in the design of the debris team, we certainly need to um, to expand the overall irrigation. Um, and we're going to start pulling out gorse uh, after the, this is kind of funny, but after the nesting season for the birds is over, which is the only time where we can start doing it. So the renovations on that, on that track are going to start. We'll also start kind of building tee boxes um, and building greens kind of through the winter and into the early spring. So there's a lot of really exciting things happening over at Spay. Uh, but again, not the focus for today. The focus for today is, you know, the future and looking forward. Um, so with that, I'm going to kick it over to Chris and to Bez. Now, a quick reminder, just maybe housekeeping items. So anybody that um, is on the call and was part of the kind of the seed investment, you're going to be getting an investor update um, this week by end of week. Uh, and then, as we said, we're also going to be um, holding another podium next week for anybody um, from the, the Lynx community that wants to listen in on kind of the overall strategy of the project and where we're going. So this today is for courses. Next week, we'll be talking about overall strategy. And anybody that is a seed investor, you'll have a, a kind of a, an overall update by the end of this week. So anyway, exciting times, guys. Uh, with that, I'll kick it over to Chris and Bez. Cool. Thanks, Jim. Um, so yeah, I guess before we dive into sort of the details on specific courses and the U.S. search, kind of wanted to give just a quick sort of high-level general update on the process. Um, I'll say first and foremost, acquiring Spay has made us a very credible buyer in the marketplace. You know, obviously we could talk all we wanted that we were going to buy a golf course and we're going to visit sites and due diligence and all that stuff, but until you actually write a check and make an acquisition and close on transaction, um, it's kind of all talk. And so purchasing the course has been sort of game changing when it comes to the perception of links among brokers and course owners. You'll see when we get down later on in the call, when we start talking about opportunities that are sort of on our sort of metaphorical desk right now, the vast majority of these have been inbound. And so while we are continuously sourcing outbound opportunities, um, we've started to see way more inbound from brokers and course owners and site developers because they just know that we are that much more legit um, and we're serious about what we're doing. Um, obviously, as we said before, the U.S. course search is continuing at sort of full speed. Um, we've got a lot of prospects that we've gone deep with in the diligence process over the last few months. Um, and so um, there have been fewer updates just because we haven't gone as deep with these guys. They've been more superficial sort of reviews. And so frankly, it you know, wasn't worth sort of bothering with a long exhaustive call when there were only a few things that, you know, even sort of percolated that we thought were remotely interesting. Um, but going forward, we're gonna to aim to communicate uh, out more details more regularly um, 
almost regardless of whether we start to go deep um, on certain projects or certain opportunities. As Jim mentioned, you know, we are extremely engaged with a great group of architects. Um, virtually every architect that you could name um, in the world of golf today that actually is building something of, of significance or redesigning, renovating, you know, significant golf courses, top 100 golf courses, is someone that responds to our text messages, answers our phone calls, gets back to us virtually immediately, has opened their sort of Rolodex to us. I think we've mentioned this before, but if not, like Chris Haspel, who's our agronomist at Spay, who um, is currently literally sitting on a, you know, not currently right now, not at this incident at 1 a.m. Scottish time, but, you know, virtually on a daily basis is sitting on a dozer shaping the new Tom Doak course at Cabot Highlands. Um, and so we're incredibly fortunate to have Chris's insight as we start to do more work on, at Spay, particularly around the water sourcing and gorse removal. And we got to know Chris through Bill Core. Um, Bill literally just texted Chris and said, you need to talk to these guys. Um, and so aside from the architect side of things, you know, we continue to be in touch, close touch with the team at Kemper, um, Gene Leon and Josh Lesnick over there. I know that one of the questions um, in the that was submitted was around the sort of nature of the Kemper relationship and how, how it's evolved over time. You know, we continue to, you know, look at opportunities that that they bring to us, and we continue to view them as, you know, one of the best possible partners for managing a, a U.S. based um, site, and so. Um, I'd say really not not much has changed in terms of the relationship we have with them. The only other thing I would address that was brought up in one of the questions is sort of potential conflicts of interest as it relates to course acquisition. And so the agreement we have with them is if we source something, we have effectively a rofer on it. And if they see it first and it's already in their database and pipeline of something that they're diligencing, then they don't have to bring it to us. And Obviously, we've been working with those guys for a long time, and that arrangement has worked out you know, extremely well. Um, and then, obviously, we, we hired IMG to help us on the Scottish side of things, and they've been, been fantastic. We have a weekly call with, with Chris and Russell from the IMG squad. They sourced BERT for us. They've been instrumental on engaging with, with vendors and contractors and suppliers um, on the other side of the pond. Um, until we had someone on the ground and, and even now with Bert in place, they continue to be extremely helpful and complimentary to the work that he's doing. So um, that's been uh, money extremely well spent um, and they were eminently affordable uh, and reasonable. And then sort of at a high level on the US side of things, you know, it's definitely a tough market. The golf industry continues to be extremely strong. Um, Prices are high. Um, owners really don't want to sell because they know that they're sitting, owners of good assets, put it that way, don't want to sell because they know they're sitting on something that's quite valuable. Um, and then obviously interest rates are up and credit is tightening, which has reduced you know, financing flexibility, um, which is why we have continued to explore a variety of different options and structures for acquiring um, and sort of bringing a US course into the links sort of network fold. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that um, later on tonight with how we're evaluating a few different sites uh, with, with a few different scenarios in mind. Um, so yeah, we're uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Chris to sort of set the table for the remainder of the call and then we'll, uh, we'll dive in from there. Yeah, so what we'll plan to do tonight, we're going to go through basically a bunch of opportunities that we have, you know, looked at in some form or fashion throughout the past, you know, past number of months and ultimately turned down. So, you know, we've got some requests along those lines. So wanted to share some more detail there and, you know, dig in on the reasoning, what we're looking at, you know, give, give people a flavor of that. And then, um, after that, we'll go into, uh, you know, we'll go into some detail on kind of courses that are under current consideration or, you know, where we're in the middle of diligence or, you know, kind of in the thick of things. So, you know, throughout this, we 
we'll disclose some course, na case, course names where we can, but uh, it won't be all of them. I, I know people uh, would love to get all the names, but I, you know, we, we aren't able to share everything. You know, in some cases we're under NDA or it's a more kind of sensitive off market deal. And, you know, it is important for us to maintain good relationships with the owners, certainly on the ones that we're currently talking to, but also the brokers and just kind of reputation in the industry as we, as we still seek to acquire more courses. So, you know, just kind of a heads up on that, but we will be sharing some specific course names where we can. Um, and yeah, and I think just also as a, it's kind of a broader reminder. So, you know, as we go through some of these examples or, you know, as, as we think about how we're guiding our search more broadly, you know, kind of the one of the main data points we're using is the ranked choice vote we did last year where we asked for the community's input on, you know, what attributes are most important, less important, so on and so forth. Um, so, you know, we can, we'll probably reference that a bit tonight, um, but by and large, right, the top priority, the top attribute that came out of that was a high quality course or at minimum a high upside course, you know, something that has the, uh, either currently or has the potential to be kind of top 100 quality, at least. Um, so that has been, you know, kind of a guiding point, a uh, North Star, if you will, as, as we go through that. Obviously, you know, we'll, we'll go through, you know, many of these examples, but, you know, it's, it's, it's not possible to hit like every single criteria that's on that list that we voted on. And, you know, it's, it's all about trade-offs as we look at a lot of these things, but, um, you know, we'll go through some of the reasoning and, you know, pluses and minuses of the ones that we've looked at or, or uh, are looking at. Um, but I, I will say, you know, as we're, as we're going into this, one, one thing we have done is I would say broadened the search over time. You know, we're it, it, early on in the project, you know, we had some polls or did some voting on like geographic areas of interest and so on and so forth. But, you know, the fact is, as, as time has gone on, we have, uh, you know, kind of widened the funnel. We, at this point, I would say, you know, we want to look at really any, any, um, potentially attractive opportunity in the U.S., right? So that's mean, that means we've looked at uh, courses, every geography, you know, public, private, semi-private, all different, you know, structures, ownership structures, and so on and so forth. So I, I think, you know, Bez was talking about the process in general. That is something that's kind of, I would say, changed over time. And, you know, at this point, we're all about uh, kind of looking at everything that we can. Uh, and then maybe one last plug before we jump in. So, you know, one, we've mentioned this before on calls, but one of the kind of most important things to our course prospect funnel is getting to see off market deals, off market courses, courses that are interested in selling or, you know, potentially willing to sell, but aren't, you know, just listing on, on, uh, you know, real estate website or LoopNet or wherever. Um, so, you know, we continually ask for input, but, you know, this is where the community can be really helpful. If you, you know, have leads, have ideas, please don't hesitate to reach out to me to Bev. We're always looking for more leads. Uh, you know, we're interested in tracking down anything we can. So just a reminder um, to please don't hesitate to reach out, whether that's directly to us. There's a course prospect form in the Discord, which, you know, you can probably share the link to as well. Um, but we're always looking for more of that. Okay, so enough table setting. Uh, I'll pass it back to Bez first, and then we're going to start off with a review of some of the opportunities we've looked at and, and you know, why they haven't made the cut. Cool. Thanks, Chris. Um, so, yeah, I will uh, start with a couple of them that we got extremely close on. Um, one was a private course in, uh, at least I would describe it as like a semi-private course, but definitely more of a members-oriented course uh, in Georgia. Um, I guess, yeah. Eh, well, between Georgia and South Carolina. Um, and we did a ton of diligence. We visited the site. 
Um, actually, a number of team members came and visited the site, played it. We were on site with Kemper. They did an additional level of on site diligence that will be on that went well beyond looking at the golf course and sort of the standard dil- sort of sub diligence that they would do that goes deep into you know clubhouse and infrastructure and you know staff that the cor- the club has um, and you know frankly they actually felt like it would have been and this goes back to the question around you know conflicts of interest they actually felt like it would have been an incredible opportunity for Kemper to acquire um, if we hadn't found it first. Um, and also if the owner had wanted to sell. So we had put in an offer, um, you know, I'll call it more like of an indication of interest um, than, a, than a formal offer with a number associated with it. And ultimately the owner of the, of the property decided to back out. Um, I guess I would describe it for personal reasons and really just, I think just not being ready to relinquish ownership of over the club and the asset and, you know, in some ways maybe not being sure what he would do once he sold the property. So um, that was the very first one that we went extremely deep on. It was certainly disappointing, but it checked a lot of the boxes that Chris outlined um, and that, you know, were criteria that people were looking for in the, uh, the stack ranked voting that we did. Um, and the other course that I'll highlight that we also went extremely deep on was a public course, um, in Georgia. And, uh, we went, uh, Chris and I went, uh, and played the course and visited in a just really disgusting weather. Um, I think it was like December, um, and the Kemper team also joined us, did the same amount of work. We spent a lot of time with the owner, had lunch toward the town. It really, again, I think of these two, to me, this was our preferred opportunity and one that I'll say is we aren't naming these courses because ultimately these two in particular um, were never listed. We approached the owners themselves really with unsolicited interest in what they were doing. And we don't want to tarnish their reputation or tarnish, you know, the perception of their club um, and sort of, you know, members and people that frequent it and think that it's, you know, up for sale anytime soon. Um, but this is a course that we have continued and an ownership that we have continued to stay in close t- contact with, because if they do have a change of heart, it's certainly one that I think we would pounce on and would be an awesome addition um, to sit alongside Spay. Um and so ultimately they backed out for personal reasons. I would describe it less, a little bit differently. I mean, the other course that the first one I referenced, the founder, the owner definitely wanted to make some changes and, and he has made some substantive changes to it. Um, but in the case of the second, they really felt like they had unfinished business when it came to improving the course, making some material changes that I would describe are the types of changes we would make, like moving tea boxes, taking out trees, moving traps around, you know, really altering the playability of the golf course in a way that the first one was not doing. And so I feel like they felt like, you know, like I said, they had some unfinished business when it came to sort of getting it back to fighting shape. And so ultimately um, they uh, decided not to move forward with us. And we came to them with a few different structures, if I remember correctly, Chris, right, um, that we thought could be palatable, but um, unfortunately we didn't land on, land on something. Um, and then other ones that I'll that I'll mention um, that we did significant diligence on included, you know, flying down, visiting, talking to owners. Kemper again joined us on these trips. Um, there were a few different courses down in the North Carolina Pinehurst region. Um, a 36 hole facility called Whispering Pines, a 36 hole facility called Foxfire, um, an 18 hole facility called Seven Lakes, which. I think got posted like 25 different times in the, in the discord server because they took out a sponsored post in golf digest. Um, all of these courses were, you know, very poorly maintained, lots of deferred maintenance, really hidden costs and, and had a significant amount of capital investment needs. And so the idea of sinking two to $3 million literally into the ground to improve, you know, drainage and improve um, irrigation before you even start to, you know, 
improve the portions of the golf course that you can actually see was just something that we were not um, not going to undertake. And so um, this is a kind of a common thread among things that we ended up passing on and did after we did you know a good amount of work and visited uh, visited the site. Um, Chris, do you want to take uh, you know the next few? Yeah, absolutely. So, so yeah, there's a whole cluster of courses in North Carolina, as mentioned. Uh, we'll run through some of the more recent ones that we've looked at uh, and passed on, you know, ultimately as well, uh, more recently. Um, one is a little older, we, as you mentioned it previously, but so one we looked at was called Centennial Golf Club in New York. Um, it's an hour, hour or two outside of New York City, so... You know, honestly, it had a lot of pluses to it, 27 holes, pretty good quality, and and so on and so forth. Um, this is the one that, you know, we we went, uh, I would say, relatively deep on earlier in the process. You know, a uh, number of us visited and, you know, met with the owners and so on. Um, but, you know, there's, this is kind of another common thread here uh, that, you know, the the kind of deal or potential deal was, you know, a little more complicated and had a lot of contingencies to it um, that made it ultimately kind of, I guess, very risky and also kind of hidden costs in the deal. For this one in particular, there's, you know, there's a adjacent piece of land or kind of a, a portion of the property that was actually under a, under a kind of provisional or contingent development deal that was currently in limbo with licensing. So basically, you know, I, I don't want to get too much in the weeds, but this, you know, this is kind of what we end up doing. And in a lot of the due diligence is that like in this particular case, you know, if we were to move forward with them, we basically wouldn't even be knowing how much of the land we would be ending up with because there's a contingent development deal and, um, you know, that would actually have significant impact on the course. It would cut into, I think, one or two of the holes, um, you know, impact on the clubhouse, so on and so forth. So, you know, long story short on that one, it's one of those that, you know, looked really interesting on paper. You know, we, we dove in on it. But, you know, the kind of details of the deal made it, you know, much less kind of palatable or risky, certainly at the time. And, you know, again, we, we kind of, we keep in touch with all these folks and things can change in the future, but you know, that's, that was kind of the situation there. Uh, another one in New York has been, I think, thrown around in the chats a few times as well, of course called Summers National. Um, this is one that's, you know, I, I think it's like reasonable price, right? You know, it's, it's been thrown around as something that's uh, in the chats and kind of, well, this could be very achievable. You know, we, we could afford this kind of thing. Um, but, you know, we, we did, uh, you know, we discussed this with the broker, uh, you know, who's managing the listing. Uh, it is, it's a situation where it's, it's, you know, when you really dig in on the course itself, it's very tight with housing, uh, you know, kind of, you know, housing along both sides of the fairway, every hole, that type of thing. And uh, it's, you know, shorter length, very restricted in terms of any development you could do, right? Can't expand the course, limited uh, ability to renovate because of being in a housing development, so on and so forth. Um, and, you know, in this case, and this has popped up a few other places as well, it's, it's in a residential community, right? So when we think about kind of taking over a course or what the membership looks like after that or whatever else, there's all these kind of, you know, properties uh, along the course that, you know, that uh, actually have, you know, uh, a kind of commercial relationship with the existing course and, you know, many of them tied into having memberships at the course and everything else. So, you know, just kind of more uh, strings attached, right? Something that, that makes it less attractive when we think about what would be attractive for the membership, what would all of you want to see in a course and, you know, what would make it the best experience. Plus, just kind of because of all those facts of the land, it's, it's a limited upside, if you will, limited ceiling. Um, and the, you know, again, kind of 
the one of the guiding principles as we've been going through this is wanting high quality golf, high quality course, something with, uh, if not really high quality today, high quality upside in terms of, you know, potential course ranking or conditioning or what have you, you know, and this, you know, ultimately is, you know, pretty limited in that respect, is from our view. Um, so let's see, just running through a few other examples, things that have come up. I think uh, many of these were uh, mentioned in the chat. So, or, you know, as examples of those things we could go after. Uh, one was called, it's actually called St. Andrews, uh, ironically enough, uh, in the Atlanta area. Uh, you know, somewhat intriguing listing, but this is, you know, another reality of fields. We attempted to engage and ultimately the, uh, the owner didn't and you know we we don't know why and you know it's still listed today um but you know that's just kind of the reality of some of these you know so oftentimes the listing will still be up but they've kind of decided not to sell anymore so unfortunately but it happened um another one kind of along those lines is of course called the river run golf club in maryland i think this has been mentioned in the chat as well um so again, you know, it's listed. You can we probably just send out the link in the chat, but uh, it's actually off market. We we talked to the broker. It's actually off the market right now. Um, and that said, you know, it's again one of those things that kind of looks. You look at the listing, looks potentially interesting. You know, it seems like solid conditioning, solid course, what have you, but. Um, you know, there are a lot of strings attached. They're actually, I think, if I recall correctly, they're uh, currently, like, developing the range for housing, right? <laughs> they're more or less kind of turning a lot of the land and housing development, constricting the course, you know, again, kind of has implications for what our course uh, and membership could look like there and so on. A lot of strings attached. So, you know, it's, it's one of those that ultimately wasn't, you know, wasn't something to go after. Um, and then you know, the last one I'll, I'll hit before handing back to Bev. Um, so another one that's been thrown out is Gambler's Ridge in New Jersey. So this is one that's, um, again, has been thrown out in the chat. So, you know, this one was, uh, I would say, somewhat intriguing at face value, you know, interesting location and in that it's in between uh, New York City and Philadelphia, you know. Uh, you know, good close to major metros, major airports. That was something that ranked very highly in the in the uh, the rank choice uh, voting that we did. Um, and you know, looked looked look strong on the surface. There were a few things, and, and so this is one. You know, spoke to the broker. I think had a couple conversations. Uh, you know, who visited. I think you just said. Um, so you know, we went a little deeper on this one. But there were a few things that um, ultimately had us decide to pass. One is, you know, at the end of the day, it is uh, somewhat unremarkable land, right? So you can always improve conditioning, of course. Um, but, you know, somewhat unremarkable with some deferred maintenance. So, you know, as, as Bev said, there's, there's kind of hidden costs there, right? Um, you know, it's more than just the price tag on the listing. The other piece here was it's, you know, from kind of a pure, pure financial perspective, it's, it was very expensive. You know, it's kind of I think it's something like a 30 X EBITDA multiple or something along those lines. So, and, you know, if, uh, for anyone out there in the audience is doing, you know, doing deals very high. And, you know, while that's not, necessarily a deal breaker per se obviously we're looking to use our funds wisely you know think about how we can get the most thing for a buck and you know that that is a major factor and then the last piece you know this is something we've learned over time as well that the, the kind of uh intricacies of some of the owners we've been talking to you know when when going through some of the diligence and talking with the broker just was a situation where um you know, there were some, uh, I guess, additional complexities with the current owners and uh, kind of requirements around deal structure, 
which make it which you know in our perspective made it very hard to come to a reasonable conclusion on a deal right like it just made it very tough to kind of keep going um and that's it's just another one of those things right you're talking with kind of individuals uh, folks that have owned these places and and you know in, in many places they're part of their identity and so you know you, you see some weird ask or you know people back out or whatever else um so that for this one in particular, that was just kind of an added uh, straw on the camel's back. Um, okay, so that, that's a bunch of examples for me. So you know, been kind of all over some of the southeast, some of the northeast, um, and Doug mentioned some in the southeast as well. Doug, I think you were gonna you were gonna hit uh, a few others before we go to the current current ones. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I would say the we have been we have looked at I think probably north of a hundred golf courses at this point. Um it just so happens that the ones that we've dug the deepest on and I'm kind of responding to some of the comments in the chat are ones that have been along the northeast, uh or along the east coast, put it that way. Um though I will in a second start to address a few more that we've looked at that are further west. So one is an amazing, uh, amazing resort that we were approached by. Um, it's the middle of the country. It's got 36 holes. They're building another 18. And we were approached um, by Kemper about this opportunity um, to either invest as an equity, sort of make an equity investment in the site, not necessarily buy it outright. Um, or if we did want to buy it outright, it would require a ton of financing um, or even figure out a way to just let NFT holders become members. However, they were not going to allow us to set the initiation and the dues at a price that we would, you know, want our members to, to pay. They would want that to be way more expensive. And the last piece is that it's, this, this location is extremely remote. Um, I would say as if you think Spay is remote, this is more remote. This is harder to get to. Um, this is actually, it would take longer to get to than, uh, than it takes to get to Spay on just a pure, you know, hours from door to door basis. Um, and you're frankly not really going that far. Um, so for all of those reasons, we, we ended up passing on it. Um, but again, you know, things change. We have a relationship with Kemper, you know, we'd love to potentially re-engage there if if an opportunity presented itself in a way that was uh that was more palatable. Um and then there are a couple sort of close calls that um met some criteria for us, but we ultimately still passed. One that's on the market right now is a course in South Texas called Treasure Hills Golf Club. It's an RTJ design, it's an extremely affordable price point right now. Um, however, it's literally at the most southern tip of Texas. It's extremely hard to get to. Um, it is, there is no other good golf around it, public or private, um, which again is one of the things that was exciting about Spay and has been exciting about lots of other golf, that, golf courses that we've evaluated is even if you travel to this destination to play our 18 hole golf course. There's all of this other great golf around it. Um, and so that's always been one of the things in the back of our mind as we look, we've evaluated opportunities is we didn't want people to feel like they were traveling a long way. And then all they got to do was play the same 18 holes for three straight days. Um, we wanted to make sure that we were in, you know, a network of really good network, both formally or informally of really good golf around us. Um, and so Treasure Hills just does not does not allow for that. Um, there are also a tremendous amount of questions about how the, the what the current condition of the course looks like. Um, and then another another course that we um, spent some time on um, is called Grand Oak Golf Club. It's in it's technically in Indiana, but it's outside of Cincinnati. It's kind of on that in, Indiana Ohio border. Um, it's a Michael Hurston design who's done a lot of work with Dana Fry. Extremely reasonable price. It was listed at two point seven. Um, it's a family that 
in some ways not that dissimilar from the space situation, family, family run golf course, the sort of older generation is looking to looking to sell younger generation doesn't want to continue to run it. Um, and the issue was that, you know, there was a tremendous amount of deferred maintenance, you know, as we talked about in a few other instances. So 2.7 million, you're probably looking at something more like 6 million all in when you start to factor in a bunch of other things. Um, and then also, you know, if you know, we, at this point, we've already, you know, we already have a remote, you know, course in Spay. you know, we're doing our best when coming to a U.S. location to find something that doesn't feel remote, doesn't feel far away from, you know, our hubs of, of members in the U.S. Obviously, you can fly into Cincinnati, but, you know, we don't have a, you know, tremendous amount of members, you know, in that area. And so the idea of uh, not having, you know, substantial membership there, not, you know, ton of big airport hubs, not a lot of good golf around, around Grand Oak for all these things, it was, you know, a, a no-go for us. So, um, you know, I think we'll dive into some stuff that's ongoing right now. I will say that, um, unfortunately, we can't really name, um, we can't really name these um, because we're under NDA in, I think, all of them, actually, except maybe one. Um, but it's, uh, but we'll go through them relatively quickly with a quick summary since there's a lot less uh, detail because we haven't passed at this point. Um, but there's one course down in the Carolinas that we're currently evaluating. We had spent some time on it previously. It's kind of bubbled back up. Um, we'd be evaluating it in the context of one of these more creative structures, um, be, a J be that a JV or some sort of lease, you know, you know call it a 50, 100 year type lease. So for all intents and purposes, we are operating as the owners, even though we might not have the sort of the equity uh, of being an owner. Um, we get compensated in, in other ways. Um, so we've been back and forth with the owner of this property for a while um, and currently digging in on, on seeing if there's an arrangement that, that could make sense for us. Um, we were approached by a course broker about a uh, club in the northeast of the United States, not too far from a major airport, a major city. Um, it's currently off market. The seller does not want um, does not want people to know that they're selling it. It is uh, is a very good architect who has built some of the most historic courses um, in the United States. Extremely high course quality, but one of the challenges that we're that we're dealing with right now is that it's it's quite overpriced. Um, rather than valuing the company off of an EBITDA multiple, they are trying to value it off of a revenue multiple. Um, which makes it look way more expensive. Um, and so we're now talking to some partners about figuring out if there's a workable financing or JV setup um, that could uh, that could slot in here. Um, so I just had a call with the broker today to, to see what the latest is on the process and to see if they can loop in, um, if they're comfortable looping in one of our potential JV partners on the NDA so that they can start to dig in and do, do diligence alongside us. Um, so that one is progressing forward, um, you know, quite nicely. Doesn't feel like there's a tremendous amount of time urgency, likely given the price. So we could be, you know, it could work to to our advantage. Um, another one is a site for a new build. We were approached by the owner of the site. It's in the Midwest. Um, it is extremely intriguing land. Um, it is a... There's a lot of sand. I'll just leave it at that. Um, we actually had Keith Reb um, um, go and visit the site for us. He was driving back from uh, Montana where he's doing work for Bill and Ben on a course. And so he drove through this site and uh, met with the owner. I spoke to him a couple different times. Uh, to debrief the the meeting he had, he sent me a bunch of photos and videos he took on the site. And long story short, he believes that it would take a significant amount of time before the site is actually playable. Um, call it three to five years. Um, so that's he thinks it's at least a year of work before you even start to like 
feel like the site is like ready for golf. I don't mean like playing golf. I mean like ready to like build a golf course. So like that feels like a pretty heavy, uh, pretty heavy lift. Um, and also not only is it time intensive, it is, would be extremely capital intensive. So, um, you know, without a financing partner there and someone who is tremendously patient and a membership that is tremendously patient, didn't really feel like that was an opportunity for us. Um, that being said, you know, we're going to keep an eye on that. We never know how things evolve in the future. Um, and obviously, um, you know, we continue to tap our architect connections and relationships for, you know, helping us save time and money on diligence, right? We didn't have to fly out to this place. You know, we were able to leverage Keith who was coming, going through there and, and take a look for us. Um, here's another one we've talked a lot about. It's out in the Pacific Northwest. It would be a potential new build. We've looked at it. Like I said, we looked at it for a long time. It's technically still under consideration, but um, still a lot of work that needs to get done. Um, and after we did a bunch of digging on it, it would be um, an extremely large investment for us if we wanted to own it exclusively. So again, this would require some sort of JV, some sort of financing, not dissimilar from this Midwest new build opportunity. Um, and so ultimately, these are, you know, one, it's a testament to how people think about links, how people think, um, uh, you know, how people think about sort of the opportunity that we have in front of us. Um, so anyway, um, I'd say you know, we continue to keep these top of mind. Um, but, um, these are opportunities that we probably are going to, you know, leave on the back burner and try and look for something that is, uh, more eminently playable. And then I'll just do one more and then Chris, I'll turn it over to you for the, um, for the one that you've been tracking. Um, but again, this kind of speaks to sort of the reputation that, that links and spay has you know, brought us in the market. Um, we were, we received inbound interest from Ben Coendor who started Cabot. Ben reached out to the team at CDP um, because he was intrigued by the acquisition at spay. Um, he was particularly sort of intrigued at and sort of impressed his words at the acquisition and how strategic it was and how much made a ton of sense for what we were doing. Um, and so the CDP team put us in touch. Um, we had a call, Jim and I had breakfast with Ben in New York, I guess maybe a week or two weeks ago. Um, and so Ben actually tipped us off to a site um, down in the South that um, is adjacent. So Cabot actually, manages some courses that are not part of the quote unquote Cabot network. Um, he tipped us off to a, to a site that is adjacent to a course that they manage um, that he thinks could make for, you know, a great course. It's not a priority for them to be building stuff there. And so um, we are likely to get some more information from Ben as it relates to this opportunity. But again, this would, this would be a new build, something from scratch, but, from what I understand from talking to Ben, it certainly wouldn't have the same sort of financial uh, requirements as the Midwest or the Pacific Northwest uh, opportunities that, that, uh, that we've looked at. Oh, you know, I'll uh, mention one more here. Um, uh, Hopefully, I, I don't get thrown off stage for mentioning this because it's not in the U.S. <laughs> but uh, it it just came across our desk, if you will. Um, so there's actually a potential opportunity in the Caribbean, interestingly enough. Um, so you know, again, kind of kind of wasn't uh, wasn't kind of in the core areas that we were looking at, anything like that. But um, you know. That said, pretty intriguing uh, is the course that's kind of in the top 20 or so courses in Latin America, right? Like it's very solid uh, name brand architect, um, you know, that you would recognize if, if we mention it. I don't want to, you know, talk to course, course at this point. 
Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, very high, high quality golf, right? Um, so, uh, you know, that, that's kind of a newer one that we're still just in the early stages of digging in on, but seems worth mentioning, you know, again, downside, obviously, <laughs> not in the U.S., um, but, you know, is, is kind of, uh, I guess, diversified geographically, at least from the course in Scotland. Um, so we're going to dig in a little bit, see what we learn. Um, you know, see what it at least has to bring to the table. Uh, a little, little outside of the bound for a U.S. course update, but figured it was worth mentioning. Um, so yeah, that I think that sums up uh, what the examples that we're you know planning to run through. As you can see there, there is you know a pretty, pretty wide variety, right? Both geographically, we're talking some. Southeast, some Northeast, some Midwest, some West Coast, or, you know, Pacific Northwest, some Caribbean even. Um, and, you know, everything from new builds to, uh, you know, private course to public course, uh, and, you know, everything in between. So there, there has been a lot of variety. Uh, I will say, you know, like, give us your feedback. I'm sure you will in the chats and everything else, but you know, we're, we're kind of digging in all these. We'd, we'd love to know where people's heads are at. And obviously we're, we're trying to use the community feedback from our boats and everything else is something that's guiding us through this process. Um, so please continue to do that. Um, the, the other thing that I think is worth noting, maybe just spending a second on here, just kind of a summary of, of like where we are, what, what we've learned and I guess kind of how we're viewing the process, right? Like I, I do think at the end of the day, you know, we're ultimately, I think we're, we're trying to optimize for the feedback we've gotten from the community at some point, you know, that, that really boils down to trying to get a high quality golf course at a, you know, within our financial constraints and not just, you know, buy any, any course that's out there just because it's cheap and we could have it, right? That's, that's kind of the, what we take away from, you know, the vote that was done last year and, you know, any of the comments that, that we hear in the chats. Um, so, you know, I, I think that is kind of the tension that, you know, we're trying to look for, you know, how, how can something that fits all of this. Um, and, you know, that does pull many of these, uh, you know, listening to prospects that we've been through today. Um, again, you know, kind of tell us what you think on if, if we've like whatever overcorrected on some of the, the examples that we've given here or whatever else. But, you know, that's, that is by and large what we're trying to ask for, right? What everyone has uh, told us is kind of the most important thing. High quality, high quality golf, high upside kind of, you know, uh, ability to, to get something that is really special. Um, and, you know, the other kind of takeaway is probably evident, hopefully evident from all the examples we're going through is that, you know, there ultimately we've run through so many courses at this point. There's, there's so many out there that are, you know, they're listed. You see them at a certain price on a listing. So you say, oh, that, that would be easy. To do. But the reality is, as we dig in on many of these, you know, there's either a lot of hidden costs in there that make it, you know, kind of a higher real price tag and or a lot of things attached, which make it, you know, as we dig in, a much less attractive deal or not feasible or you know, hard, hard to kind of really go after once, once we learn a little more. So, you know, if that wasn't the case, obviously we're, we're going for it. Uh, or, you know, we're, we're trying to find something that, that, you know, isn't hindered by all those things, but that is the reality of a lot of these as we dig in. So, um, you know, we're we're out there searching a lot of these opportunities. We want people to share more with us so that we can have more in the funnel. You know, there are great opportunities out there. We know this. Bay Bay came across our desk and, you know, thought it was great. Community voted on it saying it was great and we jumped on it, right? Like there are those gems that we can find and we can go get. Um, but at this point, it's just a, a matter of, you know, keeping our nose to the grindstone or ear to the grindstone. And, um, and finding those ones that can be really special. Um, okay, so I, I think that's it for me. Bez, uh, 
Well, we kind of already did a spay update. I, I know we were talking about doing some of that at the end, but Jim hit some of that up front. Um, do we maybe want to hit some of the questions that were submitted? I think we hit many of them. But Bez, did you have anything to add? Um, let me just pull up the question list real quick. Um, what is the address of the course? I don't know the address of Spay off the top of my head, but I think we can Google it and you can get the address of the course. Um, I do, but postcode IV327PJ. Had to enter that so many forms. Got it. Okay. Uh, do, 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 do. I talked about Kemper. Um, we talked about number of courses we attempted to purchase. We talked about Pacific Northwest. Um, you know, what lessons have we learned from Spay? I mean, I think, you know, the Spay, the Spay acquisition um, has taught us, I think, a lot. I think, frankly, the Spay acquisition is like kind of spoiled us because um, there aren't a lot of golf courses in the United States that are going to be, you know, that price um, that are going to have that quality of sight. Um, and so this is sort of consistent with all of Scottish golf is that it's like eminently affordable maintenance costs are way lower. The economics of a course in Scotland are just, you know, orders of magnitude better um, than, uh, than any course in the United States, even, even courses with relatively low maintenance, you know, in the U S and so um, I do think one of the things that we learned though, is that like, even after you buy these things, just shit comes up stuff takes a long time we got to find water it's going to take we got to we got four different estimates for removing gorse then when we remove the gorse we got to pick you know do we burn it do we bury it do we chip it and mulch it and turn it over in soil you know do we uh you know then we got to align on the timeline for that person then we got to you know inevitably something else could come up and so you know, all of these things, you know, take time and take longer than you expect because in some instances you're dealing with, you know, government agencies um, as it relates to sort of the water water side of things. People over there don't return phone calls, you know. So these are all things that I think we, you know, it's very easy to think that this stuff just, oh, you buy the golf course, then your architect comes in, they start moving dirt around. Like it's it's way harder um, then, and there's way more friction involved, um, than, you know, people would, uh, than people would expect. And so this is one of the things that I think has been a really great, you know, lesson for us as we look at U S sites that are going to be, you know, sticker price wise, definitely, definitely more expensive, um, than, than spay and, you know, potentially could have more sort of environmental hindrances than spay um and so it's, it's really i think sort of educated us at the level of patience you need when um you know even once you own even once you own the place and you can play golf <laughs> like there's still also you know it's like owning a house shit breaks <laughs> and there's all sorts of stuff that comes up that you don't necessarily think about or you haven't thought about planning for um so anyway um that's i would say one of the, the biggest lessons that that we've taken from the spay piece that we can apply to some other some other ones um maybe one other uh question that was on here is about you know are there any plans to raise additional capital capital to fund course acquisition efforts um i i think you know what i would say is kind of nothing's off the table right i, I mean that that's Certainly within their own possibility, uh, but additionally, kind of you know beyond just kind of straight up raising additional capital. The the other thing that we are, I mean, I mean we've, we've explored so many different structures um, in terms of you know how one could finance uh, a deal or structure the ownership of a course uh, to make things work, and so that's definitely something we.
I, I think we're we're exploring all options. So you know that you know if we find a course that is out there that um, we think fits the bill that the community is going to love, that we can make it work in some form or fashion, right? So I think just kind of more broadly, we're looking at all different financing structures and you know the ability to make something work in in that regard. We, we've so one question is like, what in your eyes would be a perfect course for us? Honestly, Spay is like a perfect course for us. Um, <laughs> I mean, location aside, but like, you know, I think it's worth sort of speaking to like why it was such an awesome acquisition. You know, obviously, you know, eighty-eight, almost eighty-nine percent of people um, of votes were in favor of putting putting forth an effort or uh, a bid to acquire Spay. So you know, there was obviously extremely strong uh, support for doing so. But I think one of the things that makes it such a awesome first, you know, an awesome, uh, an awesome purchase was that it is so unique and so compelling. Um, you know, you're not going to find, you know, as a potential sort of opportunity, like it's unlikely that something like this is going to come on the market maybe ever again, let alone, you know, certainly not anytime, anytime soon. Um, and so, you know, the fact that we were able to buy a true links golf course where you can look, you can see 12 holes or you can see the water from 12 different holes on the golf course um, that has such, you know, unique uh, topography that stands out from, Virtually every other golf course um, along that coast of Scotland is certainly, uh, you know, one of the one of the things that has made um, has made links sort of a you know an incredibly valuable, incredible um, you know, buyer in the market, and has brought us a lot of credibility, and I think has served as a really great sort of marketing marketing engine for us. And so, um, you know, as we said before, you know, purchasing. Purchasing Spay has had negligible, yeah, Cooper saying this, zero, basically zero impact on U.S. course purchases. You know, like I said last, I think last night or two days ago in the Discord, I'm losing track of time because of all of the conversation that has transpired over the last 48 hours. Um, but if we hadn't purchased Spay, we would still not own a golf course. Um, and that is, you know, that's just a fact. Um, and so I think all of us, can be extremely, um, you know, extremely grateful that we were able to pull off the acquisition that we did. Obviously, we had an extremely strong event uh, in July that a lot of members, a lot of members went to, and then, um, and then the other thing I would add is that you know we are still continuing to attract new members. Um, so, to those NFT holders who have not initiated at Spay, you know, the course is going to be incredible. Um, the reversible routing is basically almost fully complete. I know, I believe we may have dropped one of the latest versions in the Spay Bay members chat. And I think overall, and the sort of generic, you know, overall NFT holders members chat. Um, and so uh, I think 2024 and 2025 are gonna sort of see an incredible, you know, facelift at Spay Bay. And really put that course. I mean, Clayton and DeVries think that it could be a top thirty course in Scotland. And if you look at the top thirty courses in Scotland, um, it would be amongst some pretty incredible company. So um, I think uh, it's well worth taking a look on the membership side of things for those who haven't uh, haven't initiated. Um, not to mention all the other perks and benefits that come with being a member at a Scottish course. Um, that we've been able to that we've been able to tee up over there. So anyway, that's a spay plug on the back end of this U.S. course uh, acquisition call. But um, I think that covers all of the questions, right? Um, and we it covers it. We got one more from Beho Show. Um, that we had, okay. You no, know, uh, generally, like you know, the Kemper Sports relationship. I know we've been talking to them deeply when it comes to course sourcing and and kind of that whole aspect. They've been very helpful on that. Uh, in terms of 
you know, generalized member benefits, right? Something that we do a lot here. Uh, is there anything on the the Kemper side, right, that is on the table for Links members as a benefit? Um, we have spoken to those guys about this. You know, part of it is contingent upon them managing a course for us. Um, the other, like, just like bluntly, like virtually all of their courses are public. Um, they don't really manage any private clubs. So the idea of getting reciprocity is like not a thing. Um, and I think everyone really, um, I think when everyone thinks of Kemper, they think, oh, Sand Valley, Fandon, Shreemsong, which yes, they do manage those, those, those resorts. They manage those properties, but like, they're not going to give our members special privileges there because they don't need to. Like those courses are booked out 12 to 18 months in advance. Employees of Kemper can't even get on to those courses unless they sort of follow the standard protocol like any other general um, you know, citizen. So um, we, uh, unfortunately, there isn't really a major uh, reciprocation, a reciprocal reciprocity opportunity um, on the Kemper front. Awesome. Great points there. Thank you guys so much for, for answering all these questions, coming in with all these details. Um, yeah, super, super good call. Lots of detail there. And I'm sure that, um, you know, not only are awesome attendees here, very active in the chats, I appreciate you all. But as we post the recording, uh, you know, we'll have lots of conversations about these things we've looked at, things that we're currently looking at, and have this conversation continue as we move forward. Uh, make sure you RSVP for the call next week. Going to be a fun one. Lots more details coming your way. Um, and yeah, as you can see, the ball is still rolling. Tons and tons of stuff on the table. Uh, and yeah, thanks again so much to to Bez and C. Bruce for for all the hard work, and Jim as well. Um, with you know, le leveraging these relationships, hitting the the emails and the text messages with all of these folks. Um, you know, and really digging. And of course, thank you to you guys, the community, for submitting uh, all your course options and ideas, recommendations and opportunities. Keep those coming. They help us so, so much with the flow. Um, and, you know, part of this is speed, right? Uh, you know, the market's hot right now and getting first look at something uh, makes a big difference. So keep hitting that course submission form. Um, you know, and for Angle, I'll say hopefully we can find something in Smashville or Philly or the Pacific Northwest uh, above the 40th parallel or, you know, close to all of us or easily accessible that we can get some great golf in. Um, but yeah, appreciate you all very much. With that, uh, we can call it a night. See you all in the chats. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. See you all.